at uh, Trump Seri 2020, we have a special finance committee meeting to talk about TIC number 13, project amendment meeting. So the first um, order is to uh, call to order to the meeting. So we have, we have four. Everyone is, yeah, Gabriela and Ramli. Okay. Second is public appearances for non-agenda items. It seems that we don't have anyone in the chamber for non-agenda items, so we continue. And then we go to we move to the action item. And the first, I need a motion to approve resolution R-120-20 and plan commission resolution PCR-04-20 as a, a resolution approving an amendment to the project plan and boundaries of tax in the mental district number 13, city of Fitchburg, Wisconsin. And then we have the plan commission resolution PCR-04-20. It's a resolution designating a proposed amendment to boundaries and approving a project plan amendment for the tax incremental district 13. So we have a motion. Motion to approve. I don't think we need a second, right? I don't believe no. so. No, we don't need a second. Okay, so so we have in the audience um, Greg, uh, Greg Johnson. Johnson? Hello. Yes, okay. So hi, Greg, from Elias, our financial management consulting uh, firm. So he's going to uh, do a presentation of uh, what we are have in front of us tonight. So Greg. Good evening. Uh, I'll be going through a copy of the of the project plan that's before you. Uh, just a quick recap of uh, TID number 13's history. Uh, this district was created back in 2018 as a mixed-use district uh, intended to help facilitate the expansion of the Phoenix Company and also uh, help facilitate other commercial and mixed-use development uh, within the district. The original project plan included infrastructure costs, mainly road and related utility extensions, path and boardwalk improvements, and development incentives within the original boundary of the district. This amendment accomplishes two objectives. First, it includes some, adds some additional territory uh, to the existing boundary of TID District Number 13. And second, it updates the project cost category, adds some additional project costs uh, to make them TID eligible expenditures. Uh, the original project plan identified 23.6 million of project costs, a combination of the development incentives and infrastructure work. Uh, this amendment will add an additional 11,550,000 of project costs, mainly for environmental analysis and remediation, some geotechnical work and addressing some subsurface uh, conditions, other infrastructure improvements and development incentives that are expected to be related to structured parking, uh, other infrastructure and uh, placeholder and uh, other amenities. So the total district expenditures would be approximately 35.3 million. In terms of the estimated value that's anticipated to be generated within this district, we work with staff to update the uh, projections for new increment value, both within the original and the amended boundary. And the estimate is about 222 million of new increment value that would be generated. In terms of the boundary of the district and what's proposed to be added, a map is found on page seven of the project plan. Uh, parcels one through 13 consists of the original boundary of the district, uh, and parcels 14 through 30 are what's being proposed to be added as a part of this amendment. Many of the parcels, parcels 14 through 30, are already presently located within TID district number four. Um, they will now be incorporated into TID number 13 if this amendment is approved. What that means is any of the uh, new development that occurs from 2020 going forward or appreciation of those parcels, that new value will now be assigned to TID 13 as opposed to TID 14. Um, this is not expected to have any adverse impact on uh, TID number four uh, because that increment value that's been generated thus far is sufficient uh, to cover the remaining expenditures uh, that that district is still 
obligated to incur, and that district's projected to close within a few years. Um, so by adding this territory to TID 13, it just really provides additional opportunity for TID assistance to be used in those parcels um, because this district, you know, has 18 years remaining as opposed to TID 4, which is going to close within a few years. Um, there's uh, one of the reasons this amendment's being pursued now. There's two primary reasons. One is uh, compliance with what's called the 12% test, and that's summarized on page 13. Uh, anytime territory is added to a new TIP district, um, the value of uh, the existing value of the territory being added plus the increment value of all existing TIP districts cannot exceed 12% of the city's equalized value. Since the majority of the parcels being added to this TIP district are already within TID district number four, they are already part of the 12% test in terms of TID 4's increment value. So the only new value that's subject to the 12% test is about 6,500 of new value that's added to this district um, that presently isn't within another district. Um, so there is room to do this um, boundary amendment and still be in compliance with the 12% test. Uh, discussions with city staff, the new equalized value for the city as of 1-1-2020 will be certified by the Department of Revenue on August 15th, along with the increment values for all existing TIDs. Uh, based on ongoing growth within several of your TIF districts, um, it's anticipated that the city might be tipped out um, come August 15th of this year. Uh, what that means is the city could not create another TIF district or add territory to an existing district without subtracting value from an existing district or having a TID district close. It does not limit the city's ability to continue with uh, new development or undertaking project costs in any of its TIF districts. It's really more about any boundary amendments or creation of new districts. There would have to be that subtraction of value or a combination of a subtraction or closure of a TIF district uh, in order to add new value or create a new district. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why uh, this amendment's being pursued now, but before those new values come out. Uh, and there's also some potential development uh, within the territory of the new district with some developers that have some options and some land is another reason the, develop, uh, the amendment's being pursued at this time. On page 25 is a, a recap of all the detailed project costs that were included in the original project plan, specific infrastructure improvements, uh, half-mile radius projects, infrastructure projects that fall within a half-mile radius of the TID boundary, so they're TID eligible. And then there were development incentives for the Phoenix expansion as well as infrastructure, parking, and development incentives. So the original project plan allowance was about $23.6 million. Um, so all those project costs remain TID eligible. Uh, the new project costs are summarized on page 26. It's $11,750,000. Uh, 750000 for environmental analysis and remediation, uh, some cleanup on some oil contaminated sites, uh, 500000 for groundwater remediation, dewatering, and other geotechnical work, and then $10 million in additional for development incentives for uh, placemaking amenities, um, par underground parking, streets, uh, and other uh, types of projects. So the total project eligible expenditures will be 35 uh, 0.3 million through this plan. That identifies what can legally be paid for through uh, the TIP district. So the project plan makes these projects TID eligible. By adopting the project plan or amending the project plan costs, it is not a budget, an appropriation of funds, or a commitment by the city to undertake any of these projects. That all still requires subsequent approval by the Common Council. Any development incentives require a development agreement that also requires approval by the Common Council. So the project plan puts the tool in place and makes the projects TID eligible. Whether or not they are ultimately TID feasible uh, will be a separate determination. So each project has to be uh, satisfy the but-for test. Uh, before the city borrows any money or development incentive is awarded, the city goes through performer reviews, we update cash flow analysis to make sure it's likely that the increment can support the projects. So all of that will continue just by identifying these projects doesn't uh, mean these projects are automatically going forward. All that still requires approval. So in terms of the estimated new value, um, that's forecasted on page 28. 
Um, staff had some conversations with developers to kind of identify development opportunities based on the type of development that occurred with both within the amended and the original boundary of the district. This is an illustration, it's a forecast, you know, it shows if all of this development materializes, it would generate about 222 million of increment value. Uh, this TIP district is only two years old, so far three million of value has already been generated. Uh, if that 222 million of value uh, is, uh, comes to fruition, uh, that would generate about 63.4 million of new value over the 20 year life of the district. Uh, that's illustrated on page 29, just based on the current tax rate of the TIF district. Uh, so in terms of how the district could perform, an illustration of that is on page 30. Uh, we show all of the tax increment revenue coming into the district if that $222 million is achieved of new value. Um, the city re, uh, retains each year a portion of that increment to cover annual administrative costs of the district. Uh, and then we've illustrated if you know, some of these project costs are funded through development incentives. Uh, those are illustrated from 2023 through 2027. Uh, to date, there's already been one development incentive to Phoenix of 2.1 million uh, that has been awarded. The repayment of that is illustrated in the cash flow. It's important when any TIF district, really the key and success to any TIF district is managing the implementation of projects to match the timing and pace of development. So the city's done a very good job of that. Historically, um, really we show these project costs being funded in phases from 2023 to 2027. That really is going to ultimately depend on how quickly development materializes within the TIF district. Development project costs be undertaken quicker, could be undertaken slower, all depending on how quickly development uh, materializes. The project plan gives the city the flexibility from a financing standpoint to either fund the infrastructure projects through a development incentive or fund it uh, through uh, city financing or a combination of both. We've shown in the cash flow projection everything being funded through a development incentive. You know, the city will have a choice on a project by project basis to determine the financing mechanism. The preference is to do it through a development incentive because then the city's not borrowing money up front and only pays out uh, money back to the developer to reimburse them for those costs if the increment is sufficient. Uh, again, all of that will be made on a project by project basis um, and subject to future council action. But if all that uh, increment value materializes and the project costs are phased, uh, the TIF district could close a few years early by 2035. Um, you know, it's a little early, admittedly, to be projecting out the remaining life of this district, considering it's only two years old. Um, does have a 20-year maximum life, but I think the district does have significant development potential, both near term and long term, uh, to help you know pay for these projects. Uh, to, so to summarize, again, the amendments twofold adds territory to the district to capture some potential development opportunities in the near term and long term, and then also increases the project cost to identify what's a TIF eligible expense um, to give the city some additional expenditure authority uh, subject to you know, subsequent council approval. Uh, in terms of where we're at in the process, um, a lot of these meetings have been conducted uh, this evening. The initial joint review board meeting occurred uh, earlier. Um, that was just organizational in nature. The plan commission conducted a public hearing about an hour ago. Uh, they recommended approval uh, of the TIF district. It's now uh, going to be going to the Common Council this evening uh, for their consideration. Um, if it gets all the city approvals, it will go back to the joint review board for final consideration on July 21st. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, I'm gonna go first, okay? On page um, 17, okay? Uh, we have all the list of our uh, actual uh, teeth. My question is, Tip number five, that one is number six? That should be six, yes. I oh, saw that okay. I saw that because earlier, that should be six. six. What is six, you know what I mean? Yep. Okay. The value is right, but that it one. should be six. Okay, so um, so number, tip number 13, the three million dollar is the actual value that you that this uh, district has right now? 
Yes, the values listed for each TIP district is the increment value as of January 1st of 2019 for each of these TIP districts. Okay. So, so TID number okay. four, for example, presently has an increment value of 215 million 916,000. Okay, so uh, because, uh, you know, the 12% test is $410 million and we are at 353 million dollars. So you think that by, by what is August 1st, the valuation is gonna come higher for these yes, that's, parcels? Yes, that's, that's, that's kind of what we're anticipating is that by the time the new increment value is released as of January 1, 2020, uh, so that total equalized value number that's presently, you know, the 3 billion 419 million, there'll be a new number certified for that by the Department of Revenue, and then the increment value for each of the existing TIF districts will be updated as of January 1st of 2020 as well. And so in our conversations with staff, just based on known growth that's occurring in some of these TIF districts, the concern was that increment value would exceed 12% of the city's total, which would, once that occurs, you're not allowed to add territory to an existing district unless you would close an existing district and you know, mm -hmm. existing TIDs likely won't close for a couple more years, or you'd have to subtract out some value from any one of the existing districts to get under 12% to add more territory. So by doing this now before those new values come out, um, the majority of the value that's in this TID that's being added to TID 13 is already part of that increment value for TID 4. So we don't need to count it towards the 12% test again. Um, so you'll see most of that value that we're being added is already in TID 4. So it's $6,500 is the amount of value that's presently being added to TID 13 that isn't part of TID 4. That's all that's subject to the 12% test. So we've, we've got room, but we may not as soon as August. Okay, Julia, I have Julia, a question. Julia. I don't know if Randy, Gabriela, do you have a question? Gabriela has a question. Yeah, I think we both okay. do. I don't see her. Okay, yeah. Okay, Gabriela, go ahead. Thanks so much for that summary. Uh, this is really important. This is great information. I'm curious about, you said that we're transferring some of the TID 4 district into TID 13. So you said the net change is only $6,500. Correct, so when we look at, for purposes of the 12% test, and looking back on page 13, the amount of the current estimated value of all the parcels that are being brought into TID 13 is about 16,789,000. So that's all those parcels. Of the portion of that that is already within TID 4 is about 16,782,000. So the bulk of that is already in TID 4. Okay. So, but from this point going forward, any new development that occurs on those parcels, the increment value will go to TID 13. Okay. So uh, it allows more time for those parcels to essentially generate increment. It'll go to TID 13 as opposed to TID 4. Is that a typical strategy moving from one to do another? Or is it just the nature of how our TIDs are set up? It, it, it's not uncommon. It's called what's called an overlay under the statute. So if you, um, let's just use, use the simple example. If you have some existing parcels in TID 4 that really have not developed yet, um, but you would like some more time to potentially use TIF to have those parcels develop. If they remain in TID 4, TID 4 is going to close within yeah. a couple of years. That's a very narrow window. If you now incorporate them into another district, you extend that period of time. So um, overlays or this kind of strategy is, is typically used when maybe a parcel was part of an existing district, enough time has lapsed where some of that area developed, but other areas haven't, they may get an, absorbed into another TIP district to give you more time. So right. it's all permitted un, under statute. I'm curious, and I just wanted to, I think I know the answer to this question, but the 12% rule is in place so that cities don't overextend themselves. Is that generally why? It's basically to prevent you from putting your entire community in a TIF district. Yeah, okay. And then, but for us, we're not as concerned about that about that 12%, you know, we're not concerned about being overextended because we typically have development come, wanting to come here 
and we do a pay-go model for a lot of businesses. Is that is that generally why? You're, you're approaching the 12% limit because your tips have been successful. Okay. So that's okay. that's the good news. Um, it just all this really this 12% limitation does is it's until you can get under that compliance, it's just going to limit your ability to either create another TIP district or add territory to okay. an existing district. That's, yeah. So for a, a period of years, that may be a, a limitation. If something comes forward that you really would want to create a new TIP district, um, you know, you might look at some of your TID 4 or TID 6 that are nearing closure and subtract out some value from those districts with the expectation that TIT 4 or TIT 6 wouldn't be harmed because there'd still be enough value there to cover their remaining costs. So you'd have to do, if you're over that 12% limit, and let's just say for sake of discussion, you wanted to create a new TIP district, you'd have to do a simultaneous subtraction and creation to get you under the 12%. So it's not, there's ways to make it work, but um, you know, there's, you know, there's some work that needs to yeah. go into making do that. So I think, you know, there's interest in some development interest in the territory that's being added, um, and this 12% test potentially becoming a, a more of a factor is really why we're kind of doing this amendment now. Yeah. Okay. But I, I'm glad to know that it, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound like there's any adverse consequences to this. Like we're in good financial shape. This TID is. It seems like it's kind of a net. Neutral. Yeah, it, it's more of a it's more of a planning and a boundary limitation as opposed to a financial limitation. Got it. Thank you. Um, oh. uh, Julie, I have a question. Randy. Yeah, well, can I ask a question because it's hard to me to when you talk. Can you speak on the mic to the microphone because sometimes I cannot hear what you're saying, guys, from here from my phone. Oh, were you not able to hear what I was saying? Hello. Were you not able to hear what I was saying, Julia? Uh, some, but yeah, don't worry. I, I, okay, I'll I try, know I'll, a great answer, so I, I, I imagine what you ask. Okay, I'll do, I'll do better next time. May I ask my question, Julia, or, or do you have another question? Yes, okay. yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you for your, your presentation. I've had the opportunity to sit through three, and I will sit through the fourth one, and uh, each time I pick up something new and different, and just try to get my, my arms wrapped around the, this process. But uh, just to stay on page 13, uh, since it seems to be, uh, since, since we have some questions. Uh, and my question is simple, and you, you, you've outlined everything quite well, and my concern is the risk, or, um, and since this 12% must be laid out within the statutes? That's correct. Okay, if that is the case, there is no legal ramification of exceeding that 12%, at least any legal ramifications to us as a penalty? No, the there's no. To the city, to the no, city there, no, there's no penalty. It's okay. just, it just limits your ability to create new districts or add territory. There's no, sure. there's no penalty. I mean, if you're, mm -hmm. you know, if you're over the 12% test, it means you've had some successful TIF districts. Yeah, very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I, I have another question. Uh, so, Misty, can you put the, 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 the map, the overlapping, that one. So practically the parcel, I want to understand what we're, the parcel 27, 29, the triangle, that one belongs to District 4 now. Um, and we know that we have some development that they can come there. So we try to, move it to this 13 because we also know that the number four is going to close in the next two years so practically we cannot bring a new project because it's going to extend the life of the team so strategically what we're doing is moving those parcels to a newer tax incremental district this one is like two years old so it makes sense this is what we're doing it's like a that's correct. If you left those yeah, okay. left those parcels in TID four, essentially you'd yeah. only have a couple of years, you know, left. Of, and TID four is nearing the end of its expenditure period, so there's a very narrow, limited of time left to undertake projects yeah. in TID four. By putting them in TID thirteen, you've got the remaining life of TID thirteen, and that's only two years old. So it gives you, yes, a much longer horizon to mm -hmm. uh, facilitate development on those parcels. Okay. So I have another question regarding the, um, the, the, the development or the infrastructure cost, you know, that. So my question is, 
because I know that there are some new, you know, road construction um, on this tax incremental district. So what is the plan? We are going to build it before or we are going to build those infrastructure when we know that the, the district is already creating that increment to pay for that in infrastructure. So do, you, do we know what we're going to yeah. do? Yeah, any sort of, in, uh, Julia, this is Patrick. Okay. Any any sort of development, um, any sort of infrastructure improvement out there would be tied to development. So we won't proceed with any um, additional okay. roads and or, you know, let's say structured parking or okay. whatever that may, may be without a development on the table. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I have another question. Um, so this district uh, is very particular because some areas are under a smart phone code, okay? So do you think, this is a question for you, Pat, uh, do you think that a smart code would be kind of like a barrier sometime to attract more development in this district because a smart code is not too flexible? Um, I think it's, I think you can look at it one of two ways. I, I think in, in some ways the smart code is flexible uh, because mm -hmm. it, it has, you know, it's, 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 in an, it's in its infancy and we're learning about a lot about it and we're making amendments to it. Where it's not flexible is it requires the urban format and requires density, which limits things like, um, you know, the surface parking scenario you see outside Hy-Vee or Target, uh, that would not be an acceptable yeah. development within smart code. So therefore, uh, uh, let's say a grocer were supposed to, were to come to this area, that would require some level of structured parking to accommodate that development. Okay. Uh, okay, so any other question? Not for me. Nothing for me. Thank you. Okay. So are you ready to vote? So because this is, um, you know, page 28 is, so this is a forest cast of the future development that we want to attract to the team. So, um, so we expected that this district the annual total is going to be more than $200 million. So, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I think this is a good idea, what we're doing. Uh, we need to, you know, to bring the, um, this is a mixed use district too. And in order to bring more the retail and the shop and other amenities, I think we need to be proactive as a city and, and what we're doing here is try to, you know, um, using this uh, financial tool um, to bring more economic development to the area. So, um, you know, so, so, okay. Any other comments? Are you ready to vote? Yep. Yes. Yes, what? Ready, ready to, to vote. vote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So all of the favor of resolution R-120-120-20 and plan commission resolution PCR-04-20 say aye. 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 Nays. The motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So next I am looking for a resolution and motion to approve resolution R-124-20 amending the guidelines for the forward fit for business boost loan program. Motion to approve. Okay, so who is there to speak about this? Or do you want me to tell you what it is? Mike's here. Huh? Mike Z is here. Oh, Mike is there, okay. Uh, thanks again, Council, for authorizing the BizBoost program in the first place where we transferred 
150 from our traditional revolving loan fund uh, to make that program eligible to help people with the forward Dane uh, reopening. We had seven applicants. Uh, the loan underwriting committee met, and that consists of uh, finance director Misty Dodge, uh, Godwin Amagashi, a uh, banker and, and finance person, and then Dan Hardy, who's uh, an attorney and also serves on, on CETA uh, as well. So they were our, they're our loan underwriting review committee. So they reviewed the applications per the guidelines that we, that we have. We received seven applicants. Uh, two were funded, and that was from Soho Noodles and then also Heritage Catering. The other five uh, were not deemed eligible based on the criteria the way they're currently written for they might have exceeded the revenue, uh, which right now is um, indicated to be a million dollars there. And then some were part of a business entity with common ownership. And so the, the loan underwriting group struggled with could they look at, let's say, just a Fitchburg location of uh, a business that had multiple locations but a common business ownership and, and entity there. And then one of the other applicants had opened after January 1st, uh, too, and that was one of the criteria that we had uh, in the guidelines there. So uh, we wanted to, first of all, come forward, maybe make some uh, updates and recommendations based on the experience so far. One would be that since we still obviously have dollars available, uh, would we continue and have a rolling application period uh, before we kind of had a hard deadline? And uh, we think maybe some people were kind of focused on the WEDC, we're all in a business, small business grant, and we're maybe focused on those applications at that time because they kind of overlapped a little bit. So we thought that if we left open a rolling application cycle where people could submit them the 15th of each month through December 15th, and then our loan underwriting committee would convene based on the applications and uh, contingent upon there still being funding available and everything for it. So, so that's one kind of adjustment or change uh, we'd like for, for the council to, to consider possibly. The other one was in the original guidelines, uh, they were written to exclude franchise businesses. Uh, but the committee talked about would we look at a franchise business if they were a locally owned franchise and not necessarily a corporate store or a location. So some examples of that could be uh, the Dairy Queen uh, up Fish Hatchery Road, uh, even Bricks and Minifigs, the Lego resale store at Hatchery Hill, the UPS store out there. Uh, so CETA seemed open to the idea of maybe looking at those franchise businesses that were uh, locally owned if they had kind of a separate uh, tax ID and uh, uh, identification number and everything. And then I think we'd like to get your perspective on those uh, businesses that are under their common ownership, but maybe with separate locations to see, would you like us to look at them separately if they can provide the satisfactory financial documents or know that because collectively, uh, more than likely they exceed the revenue amount that we didn't necessarily want to look at just one particular entity of that common ownership or a Fitchburg location of that common ownership. And then, I think we had one other thing. Then, uh, based on maybe what you look at from an entity standpoint, uh, there was some discussion at CETA of, you know, should we look at uh, the revenue limit? Uh, I think they settled in on that. Uh, the original intent was to kind of help the small businesses there, and uh, that's one of the, maybe one of the challenges of designing some guidelines by committee. As we made some changes, we kind of started out at 10 or 15 employees and a million dollars in revenue. Then through some suggestions and from our partners at the Fitchburg Chamber Visitor Bureau and some things that they were hearing, we increased the employment level to 25 but we kind of left the revenue limit at the million dollars, and those probably don't always reconcile. If you have 25 employees, you're probably going to be at a higher uh, revenue amount than a million dollars per year. So those were some of the things, and I think um, Misty can probably chime in from the underwriting committee and uh, Julia from CETA as well, but we just wanted to kind of get your input and guidelines, uh, and specifically, we'd like to continue the program. We think there's so many unknowns out there and so much uncertainty that you know, maybe businesses that didn't apply in that first round 
all of a sudden as they get to phase three or phase four of the forward day and they kind of experience some things and they're like, boy, we could really use some working capital or some dollars to do this to kind of you know, follow the health and safety protocols and guidelines and, and implement not only for their workforce but for their customers. So we think that keeping it open through the balance of the year, you know, hopefully that we would get some additional applications coming in as the businesses continue to, to reopen under the forward day and guidelines. Okay, so who wants to start? I have a question. Okay. All right. Randy, you mentioned the, the, the increase in employees from, I don't remember, 10 to 12 or, or whatever to 20, 25. Mm -hmm. You did not increase the, 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 the million dollar cap. And, and what was the reasoning behind not increasing the, the million dollars when, when the employees, employee number did increase? Is there, there must be some rationale there. I, I think it was maybe if uh, we didn't necessarily talk about it then. I think we were getting kind of competing um, suggestions, you know, from entities. I think you still had some CETA members that were saying, hey, we're trying to help the really small mm -hmm. businesses here. I think the chamber was hearing from some others that were at the 2025 level there that were saying, hey, you know, if there's a program available, we'd like to apply, mm -hmm. you know, for it. So I think we, we focused on the employment and maybe didn't also focus simultaneously on, on the revenue. Okay. Uh, there. Uh, okay, and then back to the, you mentioned seven did not qualify out of the? Uh, uh, five. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, it, 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 you may have listed it, but is there a specific reason why those five are they, are they are something that we need to be concerned about as far as a, uh, as a community? I mean, that may be, maybe it's something we're overlooking and that they should qualify, or is it go back to the, some of the other, if they're falling within the guidelines you've already stated. I mean, corporate uh, entity and so forth. Yeah, some of them are those common ownership where they fall under that. Sure. Uh, one uh, exceeded our revenue. They were at like a million two fifty, yeah. two hundred fifty thousand there, so they were just over it. Uh, one was that, uh, uh, and this is where the, the underwriting panel felt that they couldn't kind of move forward with that one looking at it because of the guidelines. That was where they had a Fitchburg location, but they were part of a common ownership mm. there. and. You know, could they just pull out and look at just the Fitchburg location and that revenue when they're part of a common ownership? Sure. There, and then the other one was that uh, that date that they opened later in the year. Mm -hmm. uh, that one, they've already got one location in Fitchburg. This was a second location, uh, but then we also talked about if that got into the same situation. If we looked at them as common ownership, would they then be over that revenue amount? Sure. Even if they had opened after. Uh, so I think CETA did add some language here, though, in that particular situation to say um, that, uh, so it's the bullet point down here at the bottom on the first page. Sure. Mm -hmm. They're uh, in business as of January 1st, 2019, yeah. although businesses open after that date will be considered contingent upon meeting other program guidelines based on satisfactory financial statements. So that one, if, if the guidelines are maybe adjusted going forward, we maybe could take a look at, okay. you know, All right. again. Okay, very good. But the, the committee was, I think, just looking for some guidance. They felt with the way they were drafted in the beginning that because of some of those circumstances, they couldn't unilaterally, you know, just decide to, um, uh, uh, they had to follow the guidelines, sure. you know, yeah, unless we wanted to make changes to them. That's why we have them. Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. That's why we wanted to bring it back to you to say, you know, what changes would you like to make and mm -hmm. kind of share what the experiences have been to date. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, uh, to summarize this is you are asking uh, this committee to determine if we are, uh, if we approve a locally owned franchise to be part and then the other thing that uh, regarding common ownership, so you want some advice of if we need to look. I don't understand that with the common ownership. What do you want to achieve? You know, what do you want to? I guess do you want to provide the loan underwriting panel some flexibility that if it's under a common ownership and somebody wanted us to look at just the revenue of their Fitchburg location, is that something we would do? 
or would we say no because it's under common ownership and uh, they don't have a, a separate um, employee identification number and everything there that it, it's all the revenue would be counted and they would you know exceed the million dollar cap uh, uh, Julia this is Pat um, yeah I think um, this body should be looking at the recommendations as a whole from CETA and not dissecting the individual recommendations that are redlined uh, I believe you should be looking at it from that approach. And then if you'd like to amend any of them, you would do that separately. But I, that's the recommendation from staff. Yeah, but it's not clear, Pat, here, because here is, is asking us to... Yeah, we're kind of... asking here in this... We're uh, asking for their input with the, um, the common ownership. No. It's we're kind of looking for some clarification. What is the recommendation? This is why, because in CEDA, we decided that we will ask council mm -hmm. um, for recommendation. So, so what CIDA, what CIDA decided, and we were all in the same page, was the extension. And I think the locally owned franchise, isn't it, Mike? This is the two things that we... Yes. We were like 100% yes. And the other one is say, yes, we are... Yeah, we agree, but we like to have council feedback, you know, for the two, you know, like uh, the common ownership. And, right? the and the common ownership, it was like if we have a, a business that it had a feature location and suppose a Madison location, this was what you're calling the common, I am correct in that one? Right. Mm -hmm. Somebody that, you know, maybe has multiple locations in the metro area. One example is is we had one that's got a Madison location and a Fitchburg location, uh, but you know, looking at them collectively, they exceeded the revenue amount and they're under a common business ownership there. So would we look at individual, would we be willing to look at individually just the, the Fitchburg location and the revenue generated? Julie, I have a comment when, can I, can I go, this is Gabriella. Hello? This is Gabriella, can I go, can I? Yes, yes. Can I jump in? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think these changes are great. I guess my, since we've had a period of time when they were more stringent, like it was focused on the smaller businesses and we had an opportunity for people to get considered, my worry would, with having bigger businesses or franchises perhaps maybe we would accidentally leave out some of the smaller businesses, but mm -hmm. there's been a period of time when they had a chance to apply and get consideration first. So... If we have money left, my preference would be to let it go to the businesses in the area, even if they are slightly bigger or um, maybe have a more complex structure. So yes, I think if there was a common ownership and we wanted to look just at, if the committee wanted to look just at the one Fitchburg location, I think that sounds great. Uh, and I think for franchises, franchise owners in the community, I agree that you know this type of loan, if it can keep a business open or, or get them open earlier, I say that that's a win. So uh, I I appreciate that you're looking at creating that flexibility, and we're still we still have money left to support those businesses. So I would support pushing this forward to council and and uh, chatting about it at council. I'm, uh, Julie, and, and I'm in agreement as well with what uh, Gabrielle just said. But my, my the concern I have though, as far as the the, the common. I'm sorry, the terminology again, the, the common ownership? Common ownership, yeah. How do you distinguish as far as where the money, will they use the money for the Fitchburg location or, I mean, is there any way to actually monitor that or will the money, I mean, the money could go to the Madison location. I mean, is that, is that? I, I think in the narrative, a, you know, we asked the question of how they're planning to utilize okay. the funds. So they do have to provide some detail and some narrative. So you do have that yeah. to work from. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I wouldn't say that but, it's know, to the level of Randy, that we're going to go in and audit. At the end of the day, it's yeah, a no. loan, so they have to pay the loan. You know what I mean? So it's a loan, it's not a grant. I'm sorry. What? It, it's it's a grant. It's a loan and not a grant, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so they're having to pay it back. It's sooner or later, provided that they don't close, which right. is what we're hoping to do is that they don't close, right? Well, I understand that, but I mean, this is Fitchburg money. I want it to stay in Fitchburg. That's where the, the point that I was driving instead of going to Madison. Yep. Or, or wherever else. So that, that, that was the point that I was making. But I w I'm in agreement with what you were stating earlier. Just wanted to comment. 
Fitchburg money stays in Fitchburg. Can I ask a question, but Julia? Misty, my question did... also is common ownership could be that, um, you know, I have a business in Fitchburg and also I have a rental property, in Madison or, you know, Verona, and I have, you know, other businesses that are all common ownership. Do you, do you have one of those? My two, when, you know, one of the business qualify, how do you determine, you know what I mean? How do you know that they have a common ownership with other entities? That's with the, um, the tax ID number and the employee identification number. Okay. That's what they were looking at. Okay. Could you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Misty, did you have anything to add from the underwriting committee? And the only thing I'd say is as, as clear as we can make it, the easier it is for the underwriting committee to make sure that we're mm -hmm. following through with the guidelines that you're putting forth. So when I think about the common ownership, I think it's more focused on there's one larger tax identification number. Can we separate out just this piece of it? Mm -hmm. My concern, of course, with that is that the, the benefit of using the EIN is that is a form that they submit to the federal government that we have, we have good reason to rely on it. Um, when somebody gives us a piece of paper that says this piece is this versus this piece is this, it's just a little bit less reliable. Um, but in, in fact, it's a loan program. So in theory, as long as we can get that paid back based on the whole yeah. EIN, um, that that concern would be covered. Um, and then as long as we focus on just the revenue side and not the expense side. So on the expense side, I would be concerned, you know, how does one company handle the administrative costs? So do you allocate it proportionately to the Fitchburg location or the non-Fitchburg location? Do they put it all to one to make it look one way or the other? Um, but that doesn't seem to be too much of a concern as long as we're looking at only the revenue side of it for the qualification, but then the whole business as an EIN as far as the financial stability. Okay, so for what I hear from the floor is that you guys are okay with the common ownership. Gabriel and Randy? Yes, I'm comfortable with that. And Misty, yeah. I guess as a follow-up question to you. Oh, I'm sorry, Randy. I, I, no, no, I was just agreeing with you. I think we're both in agreement, yeah. so yeah. And Misty, does this language, as it's amended here, does that match your expectations for what would be easiest for the the review committee to execute? Does that make, like, it, it, does this language work for you or do you feel like there's something missing in the language that we could consider? So I, I do think that common ownership phrase is a little confusing. So mm -hmm. I like how the language in here talks about how if it has a separate EIN that we would base it on that. Um, so I think that could get cleaned up a little bit so that it is just common ownership within that EIN, not to Julia's example of common ownership amongst a bunch of different EINs. I think that could get muddy. Mm -hmm. So that could be cleaned up a little bit, but I think we understand what the intention is. So is there a way to make that amendment to clarify it? Because I, I mean, I, I'm, my intuition is to trust that assessment and move forward with it. So is there something that we need to do in this committee to recommend an amendment for, to go to council? I, I think we need to or do we need to do that? that we are okay with common ownership and then with the, the locally owned franchise, if we recommend that. That's it, because the other one are, you know, we are agreed, extension, revenue limit, um, what is the other one? Yeah. So to Gabriella's point, right now the red line language does ask that question, so we wouldn't keep that question in the guideline. So I think the, the clarification would need to be that this would be based on an EIN. If are, are you okay with us parceling out just a Fitchburg location of each of a larger EIN? Hello. I would say yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, but I, I'm just curious about the, the logistics of how we amend this, so that it's so you're, it's clear you're what everyone's about the language. I, I see maybe maybe uh, you know 
I will try that Misty and Mike can put the language here on it. Yeah, we'll just trust that, make those edits as, is that a, yeah. an okay thing to do? We can do that. We can work on that. So everybody's fine with the extension of the date. Uh, people are fine with the local franchise, not corporately owned. Uh, we would have, uh, we would consider a Fitchburg location of a larger EIN. Mm -hmm. That would kind of clarify that yellow paragraph mm -hmm. here. And then I guess uh, uh, we've got the date as far as that we would consider businesses after January 1st, if they can provide the satisfactory financial documents. And then do you want to leave the, the revenue at the million? Uh, CETA was still keeping it at the million there. Can we say something like preference will be given to businesses that are less than a million in the same less than a million in the same way we say preference will be given to employees fifteen or fewer? I, I don't know if I, I guess I don't I don't have enough of a context for how twenty five employees equates to a million dollars in revenue. So I I'd have to you know trust your assessment of that. I'll, I'll give the idea. Okay. Just one example. Okay. I had had an inquiry of a company that wanted to apply. Uh, they had about 25 employees, uh, but they were at 2.5 million in revenue. And so they, they would have met the employee level, but they wouldn't have met the, the revenue level there. So they didn't submit an application there. They weren't one of the seven. They had just called and inquired. The, the intention of the loan was to was to, uh, for a small businesses. And this is what CEDA want to continue with that, you know, is, uh, is for a small businesses, you know what I mean? So this is why we cut the, the revenue limit at $1 million. Maybe what is confusing is the 25 employee, maybe we need to decrease that to up to 15 full-time employee, I don't know, but. I think CEDA, uh, Huli, I think CEDA also mentioned that uh, you know, we could leave it as is now and see if we get another round of applications, you know, based on these okay. modifications to the guidelines. And then I could come back again, you know, at a later date if, if let's say there's still capacity out there and we could revisit the revenue uh, limit again at that time. Uh, so that's- My uh, question is, do you need to have our authorization to decrease from 25 to 15? Can the and the committee has the power to determine because we are not changing, you know what I mean? No, it's, it's a, an admin thing, you know what I mean? I don't know if we had to go back to council and finance and you know what I mean? To make the, that this the resolution actually approved the program and authorized the guidelines. So if we're making changes, we have to we have to come okay. back. Mm. Uh, we had checked with uh, legal and, and with finance and everything on that. I do have a question. That means that I think what you, if you wanted to do what you're talking about, you could give staff authority to do the first or the next round at whatever amount and then go ahead and do another round with a different amount without coming back. If it's that one simple change, I think that yeah, would, maybe, you would have to give us that authority to make that change. We can't just do that on our own. Yeah, maybe, I, I don't know. Maybe I think I will feel comfortable doing that so you don't have to come back. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So for this to change the number of employees. So maybe you can, at your discretion, you know, you the second round and you will see there are more applicants and there are no more applicants, then maybe the third round, you know, you have the discretion to lower the number to 15 and then see what happens, you know what I mean? So could it be something like, let's say we go another two rounds here, July 15th and August 15th? And let's say we still have capacity remaining after that time, that there could be discretion by staff in the loan underwriting committee to look to increase the revenue amount at, at that time? I would have been agreeing. I, I, would you be open to that? I would be open to it. Yeah, I would support that yeah. as well. Yeah, I, I think it's better for you to be able to have the flexibility to move forward rather than right. making sure we can slot it into a council meeting. And Yeah. I still think you guys need to set that amount though. Like rather than just giving us open-ended discretion. Oh, so it has to be like one million for the next two rounds and then 
a cap of 2.5 million. 2.5 or something for 2025 20, employees. <laughs> what uh, do you? Is it just the one application that you had, or, or, or conversation you had that with the 2025 at 2.5 million? I mean, have you had other businesses out there approach you, and they just didn't fall within the guidelines? Do you, do you have a, a sense of that? No, it was just the ones that that we received right. there, and then the other one that uh, I okay. didn't get an application from. Sure. So there were about eight inquiries. I just had a voicemail uh, this afternoon from somebody that I didn't have a chance to return their phone call, but they were inquiring about the grant program. Uh, so I was gonna call them back uh, tomorrow morning and just uh, uh, share with them that we've got the low interest loan program. Uh, I'm not sure if they were thinking about the WEDC grant program or there's also the one by Dane County yeah. that funded the Dane by Local program and everything. So I'll talk to that person tomorrow and just kind of figure out which program specifically, but I'll let them know about this one uh, sure. too. Sure. So to move this forward, what do we need to do if we set it at 2.5 for 2025? I mean, do you need an amendment to, to this? Uh, no. No? No? Do we need to make an amendment? We can you know, part of the recommendation to council. I think a recommendation to council would be fine, then they could do the amendment at that point in time. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what we are recommending council is, um, um, we, uh, uh, we've, we're fine with locally owned franchises. We are okay with common management ownership. Uh, we are uh, giving authorization to the underwriting committee for the next two round, cap uh, the revenue limit at 1 million, and then after that, they can increase it to 1.5, we decided. What, what was the well, number? What was the dollar value? So I think how the approach you're taking right now is you're not actually making recommendations as a committee to council. If we're doing that, we would need a motion and all of that stuff. I think we're more having a conversation and then... Oh, okay, so we move this directly to council. Okay. I think okay. that... Okay. Is that your guys' understanding too, those of you that are... Yes. Uh, yep, that's fine with Okay. Me. So right now it's... Uh, Gabriella has a motion to approve. So in okay. theory, you could, could, you could still approve it because it's guidelines as attached. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. We'll amend them there. Okay, so all those in favor of the resolution say aye. 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 Nay, the motion carry. Um, so next um, is our announcement. And um, so our next finance committee meeting will be July when? 28, I think. July 28. I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor of adjourning say hi, aye. 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 Nay, the motion as a carry, so we are adjourning at 7.